everyone and, and welcome to the second installment of the STASH webinar series on hand surgery. Uh, for those of you who didn't meet me at the first webinar, my name's Liam Peck and I'm a junior doctor at St. Peter's Hospital in Chertsey. Tonight, we're really fortunate to be welcoming two distinguished speakers, Rebecca Shirley and James Chan, consultant plastic surgeons uh, with a special interest in treating hand conditions. They currently work together at Stoke Mandeville Hospital in Buckinghamshire. However, during their careers, both have taken their craft abroad on various clinical fellowships and charitable pursuits, James to Taiwan and Rebecca to Nepal, amongst other destinations. They're both keenly involved in research relating to the pathophysiology and management of hand conditions, having been involved in and led numerous clinical trials, as well as translational laboratory research on molecular and cellular mechanisms of hand disease. Between them, they've published widely and contributed to national guidelines. Outside of these activities, uh, James and Rebecca both sit on the Education and Training Committee of our parent organisation, British Society for Surgery of the Hand, and Rebecca also holds a position on the BSSH Council and indeed on the STASH Committee. Tonight, they'll be discussing the technique of microsurgery and its application in the management of hand conditions, which forms a significant part of their clinical practice. So without further ado, let me hand over to our two speakers, Rebecca and James. And please remember to post any questions in the Q&A section of the chat, which will be answered at the end of the webinar. And we are recording this as well. So James and Rebecca. Uh, thank you very much, Lee. I'm very, very grateful to you, not just for introducing us today, but for all the work you've done putting together this webinar series and for Stash. So um, good evening. My name is Rebecca Shirley. And hello, my name is James Chan. And we're going to talk to you this evening about microsurgery in hands. We are both consultant plastic surgeons at Stoke Mandeville Hospital in Buckinghamshire. And um, we'll be showing lots of cases um, during this talk, and we've had permission to share these images with you tonight. So what is microsurgery? Well, it's pretty simple, really. Microsurgery is just operating on very small things. But to do that, you'll need the right kit, the equipment. So that's the microscope that we are both using right on the left there. And also the instruments that allow you to handle these small things. So um, the micro forceps, the micro um, needle holder, and also um, suture material. So this is a 9-0 suture, which is probably narrower than your hair. So what are the things that we can stitch together with microsurgery? Well, vessels to start with, so that allows you to restore um, circulation and blood flow into, for example, a free flap or to save a finger. We'll talk about that later on. The other things that you can stitch together are nerves. So nerves can be damaged and may need repair, but sometimes you can reroute nerves to allow you to gain function in the hand. So one of the things that Rebecca and I do is to do nerve transfers in patients with tetraplegia following a high spinal cord injury. And uh, because we work at the spinal, National Spinal Injury Center, we see quite a lot of um, patients who can benefit from, from this. But for the purposes of tonight, we'll talk mainly on microvascular surgery. So that means restoring the blood flow. And to understand that, you'll need to understand the concept of free flaps. So free flaps is essentially trying transplanting blocks of tissue from one part of the body to another in the same person. So you can, you can transplant different types of tissue. So here you can see three views of a um, block of skin and fat. And here you see a pedicle. So in the pedicle, you have a feeding artery to bring, that brings blood into the flap to keep it alive, but also a draining vein to drain the, um, the oxygen, deoxygenated blood from the flap. You can also transplant other types of tissues. So here is a gracilis muscle. So from the adductor compartment of your thigh, and, and you can take that to um, reconstruct other um, types of soft tissue defects, and the other adductors in your thigh will compensate for the loss of the gracilis. You can even transplant joints. So here's a joint from the toe, a, um, second metatarsal phalangeal joint. And that's the joint there with the artery going in and the vein draining the joint. But sometimes you can even transplant other things. Um, and in fact, a composite um, graft 
so that you have different types of tissues. And so this can come in the form of a severed um, finger. Um, and you'll have the, there are the nerves in yellow, um, a feeding artery, the digital artery in red, and also a draining vein in blue. So we talk about all these and illustrate these with cases as we go along tonight. So we're very fortunate to work at Stoke Mandeville Hospital, which has a rich historic background with uh, plastic surgeons. And this photograph was taken in 1948 at Stoke Mandeville, where we currently work. And this shows really all the eminent surgeons of the day, many of whom made their name as hand surgeons. And some of the names of the people that are in the photographs you may recognize. This photograph includes McCash, who described the open hand technique for Jupiter's disease, Flat, Mustardi, Millard of the cleft repair, cleft lip repair, Molum, Gillies, Ragnall, Barron, some names you may recognize from surgical instruments, Kilner and Hines. So subsequent to that, uh, this gentleman in the middle, uh, Roger Sabapathy did his fellowship at Stoke Mandeville. And here's a photograph of us videoing or interviewing him last year when he was honoured by the Royal College of Surgeons. And he is the man who brought microsurgery to India and has revolutionised the treatment of limb trauma um, in that uh, setting of, of of working in India and I did my fellowship in Ganga Hospital in India and this is a photograph of a case I saw on the very first morning that I arrived so one thing I think is really important to uh, just state is that the mechanisms of injury we see and the patterns of injury differ a lot in different countries around the world. So this is a common injury in India. It's a very uncommon injury in the UK. But this was a man who was on a bus and he had his hand out of the window and his hand got completely amputated by an oncoming vehicle. And on the left, you can see the forearm bones, the radius and the ulna that have been just stripped of all the soft tissue over the top of them. And then on the right, you can see how they've been plated back to the bones joining the hand back onto the body. And this is before the process of revascularizing that hand or restoring its blood supply that has to be done with long vein grafts joining together those vein and arteries that have been damaged in that central section. I think it's true to say that the Ganga Hospital, where this took place, is um, now considered the mecca for orthoplastic trauma. They run an incredible microsurgery course, which I've been on, and many other people have as well. Um, and it's um, and it's we learn so much from what this center has achieved in terms of replants, but also other microsurgical things like um, brachial plexus reconstructions and also um, severe open lower limb injuries. Now. <clears throat> Severed body parts has been known to mankind since really we invented tools. And this is a um, French manuscript from the 1750s showing this, but it's not until relatively recently that we've had the expertise and tools to be able to save these body parts and reattach them. Uh, and so that was, um, I think the first replants that were done using microvascular techniques um, were in 1960s by Harold Kleinert in Kentucky, USA. Um, and also um, from um, uh, Tamai in Japan in 1963. And I think um, in Shanghai in, in uh, China in 1963, they also did an upper limb replantation. And things have moved a long way since. Um, so these are some of the cases that we, we have seen in the last couple of years at Stone Mandeville Hospital. This is a man who got um, his um, index finger trapped and crushed in a hydraulic press. This is a 15 year old boy who was climbing a fence, but he had a ring on and slipped. And this is a chap who got his two fingers caught in a lake. And so these are fingers that have been completely ripped off. Sometimes they're not, and sometimes they seem attached. So this is a 65 year old gentleman who was climbing up his ladder at home, trying to sort out the roof and slipped um, and got his ring caught. So rings are can be really quite dangerous. And 
initially it doesn't look too bad, but if you actually took the time to have a look underneath, you'll see the tissue damage is really quite extensive. And here's another chap who came in a couple of months ago and he was playing football. The ball was um, kicked over the fence. He climbed the fence, slipped, and you can see that classic um, white um, finger that's still attached, but it's white because the blood is not getting to it. So how do we revascularize and save these body parts? There are lots of principles here, and we'll illustrate them using a case that we saw three years ago. And this was a six-year-old boy who was playing with this kind of mechanism at home. He got his finger caught in that rope. And this is what he came in with. This was at about 8 p.m. in our emergency room. And as you can imagine, his parents were pretty devastated. So uh, this case also brings back lots of memories for us because it's actually the first replant that we did together. And James did this, I think, when he was about a week after arriving as a locum consultant. So on the left, you can see what he looked like. That's the hand and where the finger is um, evulsed um, from the rest of his body. And then on the right here, we've unraveled that tendon and you can see that it's actually pulled off at the musculotendinous junction where the muscle joins the tendon at the bottom and in the middle you can see the tiny lumbricle one of the intrinsic muscles in the hand that's also been pulled off with the uh, finger so the first step is to fix the bone and here is a single k wire it's a really slender tiny little bone in a six-year-old and that was quite tricky getting it in you can see the two vessel clamps at the bottom and those are sitting holding the artery and the vein that are still attached to the boy um, and then here are some more photos that show the process of what we did. So at the top on the left, you can see that wire that's just left coming out through the skin. And we left that there for about three weeks. You can see the two vessel clamps on the vessels. The vessels themselves are quite small, so you can't really identify them in the photos. And we actually ended up opening the whole palm and the carpal tunnel, firstly to take pressure off the nerve, but also because we decided to. Um, join that tendon to the neighboring tendon or in other words buddy it to its neighboring tendon so that when the middle finger bend in that would also bend in the index finger it wasn't really possible to primarily repair this because muscle it's very friable and it would just cheese wire through so it's not strong enough to do that so we just buddy strapped it to the next finger and then on the right the extensor tendon that had also been pulled away and that we were able to just stitch back in place and allow it to knit back together. This next photograph shows on the left, that's the artery. And this is a damaged section of artery there. And you can see that's at the point we're just cutting that damaged section away. Um, in the middle, that's what that damaged section looks like. There's that corkscrew sign. So this is damaged vessel with damaged endothelium that is not good to preserve. We really want to have good quality vessels in order to maintain the blood supply through it. So in place of that, we then plan to use a vein graft. On the right, you can see a tiny little stitch that we put in before we started uh, the microsurgery, which just allows us to find that vessel because these structures are so small that it's very easy to lose them and the stitch just allows you to find it quickly and easily. You can also see a massively magnified Pacinian corpuscle just there at the base of the clip. It looks like a, a grain of rice. And, and just to add to that, the reason we have to cut away the um, stretched vessel is because with that extreme stretching, the in the most layer of that vessel, the endothelium, the intima with the endothelium will be torn. And when it's torn, it will expose the underlying collagen, which means that when blood, blood is exposed to it, it will, the coagulation cascade will, will be triggered. So even if you do manage to anastomose it and do a good join, there's a, going to be a very high chance of a clot forming, stopping blood from getting to the tip of that um, 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 replant. And the other thing is on the right side, you can see the vessel clamp and in between the two, each, um, um, the, each pair of lines, that's one millimeter in diameter. So the lumen, the diameter of the lumen within that vessel is probably just over half a millimeter. So that's the kind of size we're dealing with. 
So these photographs just show the vein graph. So because we took that section of artery away, we had a gap between those two vessels. And that gap is about two centimeters. So we took a vein graph from the wrist. It's really important to flip that vein around to reverse it because the veins have valves. So the blood will only flow one way. And it's critical that you've got it inset the right way around. And that shows that vein graft between the two ends of the artery that we're going to anastomose or join together in order to reperfuse the finger and on the right there's a more higher magnification photograph showing that tiny lumen as James said is about half a millimeter in diameter. So there he is about six months down the line using his um, his um, um, finger um, and there he is um, playing on the switch um, and let me just see if I can get the right section. So there you go, I think he's winning. And there he's also again, um, using the finger to do his shoelaces. So you, you can see he's actually using the index finger. Um, so he's not bypassing it and using the middle finger. So that, that's a good sign that he is actually functional because the whole point of doing this is not just to reattach the finger onto the hand, for his own sake is to give somebody a sensate useful finger um, and that's the whole purpose of this exercise. And in a six-year-old a massive achievement because many six-year-olds cannot tie their laces. <laughs> yeah so um, just so we've gone through um, all the principles and I'll just summarize them here using what I call the pyramid of successful replants. So the first step is to identify the structure. So you can actually take the amputated part to theatres before the patient is um, ready and look under the microscope and start identifying the structures, your target structures. So your veins, your um, nerves and your um, uh, arteries. And, and then you need to have a stable base upon which the rest of the pyramid sits. And so that's a um, the skeletal fixation. And that's a... Um, an example there um, and then you have to reconstruct the tendon um, so you flex this that curl your fingers into the palm and extends it to straighten your fingers and then you have to repair the nerve and sometimes these nerves are very badly damaged and you may get a gap like in this patient here and if you have a gap then you may need to borrow another nerve a spare nerve if you like and, and in this case we took it from the inner aspect of the proximal forearm that supplies a patch of skin here so if you can take that you get a little non-patch of skin here but that's a small price to pay to have good sensation in your fingertip and there it is um, plumbed in um, to allow the axons that, that are regenerating to go down the nerve graft and into the, um, uh, the replant. And finally, of course, once you've got all those things done, you can try and get the finger um, to live again. And that's by reconstructing the vessels. And, and the, the real key to getting these to work really is to use vein grafts generously. And you can see in this um, um, patient that we've marked out all the veins on the folar wrist and you can see on yourselves there are always lots of little veins there remember as Rebecca said to reverse the veins so you can get the blood actually going into um, the finger and there it is you can see the um, uh, vein graft um, working well and um, full as the blood is um, blood circulation is restored so there it is the um, pyramid of success and so hopefully at the end of your operation your finger will look pink like this one in the middle or um and and the wounds will heal up within two weeks or so uh, and hopefully further down the line this is um the um the chap with the ring avulsion injury it will start looking better and actually not that noticeable um this is about three months down the line you can see that the um his scars over the volar veins are still quite um quite red and obvious but that means that the sky is um, immature and over the course of the next few months it'll start fading and it'll be much less obvious. But of course this is assuming everything goes well and sometimes it doesn't. Um, you can do your very best and for, say for example there's no vein to reattach to like in this chap and then you can get venous congestion and then eventually the replant fails and that's a very sad situation but um, actually that's the minority of cases. So, 
so th these are some of the long-term outcomes and you can see how important it is for people to have good function in that um, in that replant replanted finger so here is a, a gentleman um, talking a year down the line and here we are just over a year later and uh, as you can see the finger works beautifully you can almost tell that there's actually not an awful lot um, wrong with it now and I have good feeling in the fingers so really this uh... so there he is he's the guy who slipped down the ladder trying to sort out his roof and he's 65 and he's st still managed to get almost full sensation to his fingertip but it, restoration of function is one thing but sometimes restoring it reattaching a body part has more meaning than just the function so here's an example where that is the case this is a lady who was um preparing for a wedding and was getting a wedding dress from her loft and on her way down she slipped and she um her engagement ring pulled off her um finger there she is uh, five months down the line so I just want you to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much because what you've managed to do for me is amazing. I now have a finger that works, still way to go, but it works and I have rings on it. <laughs> um, and it's, I, I, I don't feel self-conscious about it at all. It looks almost normal um, and I can move it almost normally. So, and this is that I took her back to theatre to do a tenolysis, which means releasing the tendons from the scar to allow her to move more smoothly. Um, I wasn't able, the um, distal interphalangeal joint was fused. That's why it doesn't go right into the palm, but actually she's gone back to working and she's a healthcare assistant. So there we are, replants in a nutshell. So um, here's a photo of a patient, another teenager who came in when I was on call. So this finger came in appropriately stored um, in damp gauze in ice, as uh, shown on the left. And uh, that's what the finger looked like when it came out. So I was very hopeful that I would be able to replant this. And this is what the tip looked like. Now, the two structures you can see there are nerves. Um, and I couldn't find any vessels at all in this tip, which is disappointing. And if you look at the finger, you can see that all the vessel right up to the trifurcation, the level at the DIP joint where the vessel separates into three is all on the finger. And that meant that there wasn't any vessel big enough to join onto the finger. And this boy was very, very keen to preserve the length of his finger. And actually, for functional reasons, that's really important in order to maintain what we call palmar continence, to be able to hold objects in the palm of the hand um, and to also be able to have a good grip strength in a young boy. So in this case, you can see here what was left on him, a good quality tendon. This tendon, if it's left exposed, will desiccate. It will dry out and then it won't be functional after that. And also you can see on the bottom right, that's the surface of the joint. So the joint, the DIP, the distal interphalangeal joints being opened right up. So we made a decision to fuse that joint because these structures are incredibly delicate and movement at that joint, if that fused actually he can still have a pretty good functional finger but so he was very keen to preserve the length so this posed us with a problem and it brings us on to the next part of the talk which is about free flaps so for this um, young chap we decided to try and preserve this finger using a free flap which is um, as i said to you before a block of tissue with his own vascular supply um, transplanted from another part of the body and so um, this was this is where microsurgery can be a lot of fun because you can be quite creative with this. So this was a, um, our design. We wanted to um, replace skin with skin, like with like. Um, and so we imagined that if we had, we could um, design a bit of skin like the um, diagram on the top left there. And this um, blue circle in the middle being where the blood vessel would go into it, then you can all origami it um, in a way so that they can kind of form a lollipop over the um, degloved finger. And so there, there I was um, trying to cut out the template 
and we'll put the template on the thigh where we're going to take the um, skin from. And that was the free flap. So that's the um, bit of skin with the um, blood vessel taken that's gone, been dissected out of the um, quadriceps muscles. And then we'll cut that skin um, to the design. Before so we do that, the, Rebecca, you go, sorry. Oh, I'm just going to say about that flap, you can see on that photograph that it's quite thick and the skin on the finger is um, comparatively much, much thinner. But the first goal here is to get early soft tissue cover to preserve that tendon and stop it from drying out. Um, this shows, this is the same patient, and uh, one of the challenges we had here was that when we came to plumb the vein in, there was no good vein on the palmer side of the finger. So when we thought about it, we decided we would find some small veins on the back and use those to plumb it into. And this was a real challenge, actually, because we had to move those little veins from the back, feed them through a little hole onto the front in order to join that onto the vein from the vest from the flap you can see that little vessel there um, this is uh, artery here with the tiny sutures again the 90 as james said the size of a human hair and on the right that's a view from the microscope so it's not the best quality but that shows that tiny vessel again less than a millimeter in diameter with a number of stitches through ready to tie together so this is what the finger looked like at the end of the operation, as you could see quite a, a big blobby finger because of the thicker layer of fat on the thigh than on the fingers. So we're giving him a Cumberland sausage and that, there he was actually only a couple of um, months down the line and he had a really good range of motion in the proximal interphalangeal joint. Um, so he could actually make a full grip. The only thing that's stopping him forming a really tight grip was actually the bulk of that flap. So, so I took him back to theatre uh, with Rebecca, if, um, I think last month, and we thinned it. And there he was. And so the finger is much more finger-like um, and much thinner. And he's actually due to come back in a couple of weeks for us to thin the other side. Um, and hopefully, um, in due course, when the scars have all matured and everything, then we can send him to a tattoo artist where we can then tattoo a nail complex on the on the back of his finger so it looks much more normal. Here's another patient, a completely different situation, who was a driver of a car. So this is a high impact and um, and high energy injury and you can get a feeling from that when you look at the position of those bones and uh, so he's completely broken his radius and ulna and they're very significantly displaced and unsurprisingly the skin over the edge of it has also been significantly damaged so the first thing here is to take him to theater the orthopedic team put two plates on and they restored the uh, anatomy of the skeletal fixation and if you look here this is what we were left with that tendon there is uh, the brachioradialis so it's an elbow flexor and if you look carefully you can see there the plate that's exposed at the bottom of the wound you can also see the vessels that we've started to find because we definitely need soft tissue cover over this in order for that wound to heal and to prevent the plate from becoming infected so that he will have a good functional arm and in this situation we just opted to use a muscle flap so this is a gracilis flap from his inner thigh one of the adductors you can get an impression of the muscle there on the top left before we trimmed it down and it's inset it these muscle these muscle flaps are always quite bulky like a hamburger on the limb but they do thin because they're not working as muscle anymore so they atrophy quite quickly and flatten and on the right there you can see that we've covered it with a split skin graft in order to get that healed and that success covered the exposed plate and tendon. This is a different situation, this time a much lower energy injury. And this woman is a keen marathon runner and she fell and she's in her early 30s, but she has significant osteoporosis. So from a low impact fall, she broke her wrist, which required a plate. And she had a very unfortunate situation that she got a, a 
condition called a compartment syndrome. And in this, that can happen with any break in the bone, the muscles become very tight in the compartment. And it's a surgical emergency because if you don't release that compartment, those muscles will lose their blood supply, but they can also make you very generally unwell because they release toxic metabolites. So the woman had the correct treatment of being taken to theatre and had an urgent fasciotomy. And you can see from the scar, they've cut right through the fascia of her forearm. And what often happens after this is skin is um, very elastic and it can strip, it contracts and it contracts in such a way that she needed a skin graft that you can see in the middle here. And that in itself is not a problem. Um, she wasn't worried about the cosmesis or the appearance of that, but was a really big problem was that this caused her tendons to get stuck. So she was unable to make a fist. In fact, she said when she was running, she couldn't pick up a water bottle off the table during a marathon. So actually really a very significant functional problem that affected all activities in her day-to-day -day life. So the indication to do the operation here was really um, what we would call a tenolysis or freeing all the tendons up so that she can make a good fist and fully bend her fingers in because she only was able to get them to about there. So we um, opened that all up. We removed that skin graft because after a tenolysis, it's not possible just to stick the skin graft back on because they'll just get stuck again. So in this situation, we needed a nice layer of fascia, something that those tendons could glide past. And we also took the plate away, which you can see on the right, you can see one of the screw holes right through that plate after the plate's been removed. So that first part of the operation we've successfully freed up all of those tendons so they're now able to fully glide in that field but we then need some soft tissue cover because there's not enough skin to cover over the top so in this case we elected to use another flap from the thigh so this is what we call the anterolateral thigh just as as it says in the tin is on the front and on the outside of the thigh and and so you when you, if you imagine the um, quadriceps muscles in your thigh, all those muscles are contained in a kind of stocking called the deep fascia. It, it's actually exactly that deep fascia in the forearm that gave that lady compartment syndrome because these the um, stocking is so tight that it doesn't expand very much. So when you get muscle swelling, then then it can occlude the vessels that are feeding it. In this case. The fascia is our friend. So we can take the, the layer of skin, the fat underneath that, but we can also take that thin glistening fascial layer that you can see here that when the flaps are reflected um, away from you. Um, so this, can you see my pointer? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So th this is the fascial layer and you can see that there's a lovely gliding surface for the tendons to glide against. So there we are. So we took the... Um, fascia with its pedicle, and we joined up the artery and vein in an end-to-side fashion. So that means that, um, and this is onto the radial artery um, for the um, arterial input. So the uh, radial artery is coming along like this, and you join, rather than joining it end-to-end -end so that the blood is no longer going into the hand, but into the flap, you can join it end to side so that blood continues to go into the hand, but also can feed the um, flap. And we like to do this a lot in the limbs because we still want to have good perfusion to the fingers and toes. So there she is at the end of that operation um, and further down the line. And the other thing about this lady is that after having this extensive um, surgery, she actually opted to have a change of career and she since trained as a nurse so she said that the treatment that she went through very much affected her decision making in a change of career so um, it shows that sometimes there can be impact that's outside the actual functional goals that we're setting out to achieve oh and the other thing is we we then took away the um, skin paddle i think just uh, for the cosmesis yeah so we've shown you lots of examples where microsurgery is useful in the trauma setting, but sometimes there are other conditions that can give you massive uh, soft tissue defects that you need microsurgical techniques for. So here are a couple of cases for you. 
So um, this is a condition. Uh, this lady actually came into A&E. She wasn't very unwell, but she had worsening pain for about 24 hours in her left hand. And she had this small area of eczema that you can see on the left, which is just inside that area that's been marked. And when she first came in, it wasn't really suspected that she had an infection, but it wasn't really clear. So she was admitted for some antibiotics. Um, and in the first 24 hours, things progressed and changed quite a bit. So um, this is what she looked like when I first met her, which was about 24 hours later than that first photograph. So you can see that something is clearly developing quickly. And at this stage, she had completely numb fingertips and very significant pain. She was also very unwell. She was vomiting and she felt very sick. And the diagnosis here is necrotizing fasciitis. So this is a surgical emergency. We got the intensive care team involved and we got her to theatre as soon as we could. And uh, I think if I remember correctly, this was we just finished doing a free flap and then we were told to go to the ward to see this lady. Yeah. And so James and I actually saw this lady together late at night on the ward. We got her to theatre promptly. When we scrubbed those blisters away, this is what it looked like. And then we went straight into cutting through the skin to do an extensive fascial excision and these photographs are from that first debridement so it's really frightening how quickly this condition develops she grew group group a streptococcus so um, that's the mono um, microbial um, necrotizing fasciitis that spreads very quickly it's really useful to discuss these cases because hopefully that means more people will recognize and treat them promptly so the first step was really this life-saving surgery to remove that uh, infected and rapidly progressing tissue and actually that was a good debridement as she did go to theater several more times but didn't need more extensive debridement than that and she uh, spent about a week in ICU I think yeah, she was in intensive care for a week. Um, she needed hemofiltration. She needed antibiotics and she gradually improved over that time. So at the point when she was systemically well, we started thinking about trying to get those area covered. Skin graft here we felt was not a good option because, again, she's got those exposed tendons that James mentioned before. They're not graftable surfaces. She also has her median nerve right on the surface on the palmer side. And that can cause lots of pain issues if it's grafted directly. So we wanted more robust soft tissue cover with some nice fascial layer. And in this case, we opted to use two anterior lateral thigh flaps, one from each thigh. So there we are, um, um, doppling out the where the perforators, these are the tiny vessels that are supplying that skin um, and designing our flaps. And they're... There we are, the two flaps harvested um, out of the thighs. So we gave her bilateral thigh lifts. Um, and that one, this is one of the um, um, flaps and that was to cover the dorsum of the hand. And that this was the one that had a fascial layer to allow the glide like the last patient. And on the other side, we used another flap um, which didn't have the fascial layer so that it will be a bit thinner, but you can see it's still really quite bulky. And it, <clears throat> for those of you who are observant, you'll see that on the right, um, in the right picture, the flap is a bit mottled. And actually that's because the pedicle got a bit kinked. And so we had to bring her back to theater a few hours later and then just readjust the positioning of the pedicle. And then the blood um, started flowing again and it was absolutely fine. So I think that's a very important point just with free flap surgery, the importance of monitoring them closely, because there's no doubt that when she developed that problem and the blood supply wasn't leaving the flap quickly, if we hadn't picked that up, then that flap would have gone on to die. So it's really important to monitor these very closely. And fortunately, we were able to salvage that flap. And then this is some photographs taken a few weeks down the line. So some of those areas have been grafted and you can see that both of those flaps are quite big and bulky but as we said in previous cases the first aim is to get good soft tissue cover and then once that's the case we can go on and thin these flaps and look at the cosmesis and make them look more like a functional arm and this woman is very grateful to have preserved her arm she has good sensation in the fingers so it's a very useful limb 
albeit limited and not fully function and it will never be the same hand that she had before it still has real benefit for her and it's important to note that these pictures that you're seeing represent the beginning of a reconstructive journey. She's now had a um, one session of um, thinning of the flap and she'll have several more, but hopefully in about a year's time, her hand will look much more normal than it does now. This is another lady also with the condition necrotizing fasciitis. So you can see from these photos that this defect is much less extensive than the other lady. And uh, she also had prompt theater. She had debridement of the affected area. And she also has exposed tendons that are not graftable. And in this case, we took a flat from a different area. On the, on the left uh, bottom photograph, you can see that's her calf. So this is a MSAP flap, a medial sural artery perforator flap taken from the inside of the calf. It's you can't take such a big flap from this area, but in this situation, that flap was big enough. And you can see on the right, that's a template looking at the size of the defect we need. And then on the bottom right, there's the flap with that tiny pedicle, which has got the vein and the artery hanging down at the bottom in the middle. Again, you can see that uh, thigh has more uh, fat on it than over the dorsum of the hand. But if necessary, we can thin these flaps down at a later date. And that blood vessel, um, that perforator, what we call the M MSAP, the medial sural artery perforator, is basically just a branch that comes off the popliteal artery behind your knee, and it travels through the calf muscle, the gastrocnemius, and on to supply the um, skin overlying that. So these show some of the photos of just setting up the micro. So we put this onto the radial artery. If you see, we made a small separate incision over the radial artery. On the top left, we've marked there the artery, two veins. So it's usually two vena comitans that sit with the artery. And then there's a superficial radial nerve in the yellow there. Uh, on the top right, you can see the vein and the artery that are both joined together. We use a little indwelling Doppler, and that's what that wire is that sits with a silicon sleeve around the vein so we can monitor that from an external machine. And then at the bottom, there's the flap with a little drain in situ. <clears throat> Now, this lady had a problem with the flap. If you look at the top left, you can see that she's actually lost the skin layer of it. It doesn't look healthy at all. So we took her to theatre and debrided that uh, tissue, the skin that didn't look healthy. And underneath there is healthy fat. So what you can definitely see is that the tendon is no longer exposed. And this does represent a graftable bed. And on the left, this just shows James Dopplering out that little vessel, the pedicle in the um, flap that's still making a, a sound. So it's still pulsatile. And on the bottom right, that is a, a split skin graft that was put over that. And you can see that that has taken well. And this lady also has now recovered well and she's gone back to work. So, so we talked about trauma, we talked about infection, but sometimes there are other things that can, um, where microsurgery can be useful. So this, um, this is a case of a um, chap with a tumor. He, he was a um, guy I saw, I think two and a half years ago, he's in his thirties. He's a right-handed man. Um, he works in an office space job, but is a very keen bodybuilder. And he came to us actually through the trauma service because he had sustained a fracture through the proximal failings of his right little finger. And it was a curious story because he didn't do anything more than, I think he was doing press-ups or something. And it was weird that somebody would have a fracture doing a press-up. So he, we did an X-ray and found this expansile lesion at the base of his proximal failings. And this looks very much like what we call a enchondroma, which is a benign, uh, tumor um, of the hand is quite common and the the um, uh, treatment would normally be a surgical curatage which he did go go on to have and but then the histology came back as something that was unexpected it wasn't an enchondroma it was a um, gran granulomatous and uh, giant uh, reparative uh, tumor <laughs> reparative tumor sorry so it, it's also it's a, a benign thing but can 
continue to expand and become locally invasive. So this was discussed at the um, sarcoma MDT and the plan was to excise that section of bone. But of course, you can't just leave a massive gap in the bone there. Um, and so, so then the easiest thing to do would be to amputate that finger. But he was absolutely adamant he wanted to keep the finger. So we decided to try and preserve it and transplant his second metatarsal phalangeal joint, the second MTP joint, um, and, and put that into the hand. Now, if you look at your own toes, you will realize that, well, for most of you, well, the ability for your toe to bend backwards is much better than his ability to bend forward. And that is the opposite situation from your hand, where, you, where your fingers are very good at curling into your palm, but not so good at bending backwards. So we decided to take that joint, the metatarsal phalangeal joint of the second toe. Uh, and you can see the artery um, here in red and the vein here in blue. And then flip it 180 degrees so that the bending backwards of the toe becomes the forward deflection in, into the palm. So there's the joint that's been taken out with the artery, a feeding artery and the draining vein. And that's the uh, joint put into the hand and fixed there. And just to give you an idea of the scale, again, these are our super microsurgical instruments, which we are very fortunate to have. Uh, the tips of the forceps are about 0.1 millimeters in diameter. And that's us um, dealing with um, one of the um, vessels to plumb it in. And there he is at the end of the operation and he had pretty good passive range of motion. That's him a few months down the line. And he was getting there, he was still improving with physiotherapy, but he's starting to get a good, a decent grip. And you might wonder what's happened to his foot. Well, there, there it is, we've done a re-amputation. And actually his foot is functioning really well. Um, and he was able to easily um, do um, long runs with, with it. So there we are. So lots of different um, scenarios in the hand where microsurgery can be useful. But I think it's important um, to not just lose sight of the overall picture. The technical um, things are, of course, really important, but more imp at least as important uh, as that is the team around you and to set the right culture so that the people who are going above and beyond, because these are long, tedious, um, painful cases, um, they need to have a can-do attitude. And that's that's the, all the people that were involved in one of our cases. So it's a pretty big team. And that involves um, various things. So one of the things that we started um, doing is a team brief. You know, the WHO checklist that we do in the morning becomes a much more um, expansive affair where we go through the case history and the um, latest examination findings. And really, this is a very good opportunity to galvanize the um, different team members, be they um, scrub nurses or anesthetists. So everyone understands why we're going to go so hard to try and save this finger um, for the patient. And they, so they, they feel like they're part of something special. Um, and then the other thing is we have started giving people um, um, the, the team feedback. So every three or four months, we get patient uh, testimonials, videos um, to thank the staff because they, unlike us, they don't have the privilege of seeing the outcomes of these patients. And they work so hard and they don't get to see that. So we think it's only fair that they get thanked as well. And, and all this is important because it then gives, infuses meaning in people's work. Everybody goes into healthcare wanting to make a difference to people's lives. And sometimes with all the bureaucracy and all the, um, all the things going on in different healthcare systems, it's easy to lose sight of that. And if we can remind people why we're doing what we do and why we work so hard, then I think that um, helps um, make a difference to lots of people. Yeah, so this demonstrates just how microsurgery can be uh, very important and significant. It's a very powerful tool uh, 
Uh, we're passionate about it and we also run a course. Um, this is a QR code here for the course. We run that course about three times a year and we spend a little bit of time talking about cases, but the emphasis is really on just practicing. Um, we've got screens for all of the scope so we can give hands on advice and uh, you can learn new skills throughout the day. That's it. And it's great fun. That's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I think microsurgery is a challenging specialty. It's very rewarding. And there are many situations in which it is the only solution to difficult problems. Thanks very much. Thank you both so much. That was a fantastic, uh, fantastic webinar. And as, as you mentioned, a real sort of fantastic advert for the restorative power of microsurgery. Um, we have a few questions, some of which were sent in before the webinar and some uh, during. Um, so we have one question, which is, when do you decide not to do replants? So uh, I'll say a few things and I'm sure James will also say a few things. So um, it's definitely situations where uh, replants are not appropriate. Um, very often uh, patients don't want them. So their thoughts are on the situation are important. If you have somebody who is a manual worker um, who has taken his index finger off and wants to get back to work as quickly as possible, uh, the best option is to terminalize that. So it's really important that the options are discussed with the patient. Sometimes for other reasons, significant other medical problems, other life rate saving, uh, threatening injuries might make a replant unsuitable. Um, I think as well, there is a surgeon choice. We're definite advocates of replanting fingers um, and technically it's a difficult operation to do. James says it's easy, but I think it's really important to get every one of the steps right. So um, it's important to have a fully motivated, consented patient before embarking on it. Um. There are various contraindications. I think um, smokers are definitely not people to try on because they get huge facial spasms of their digital arteries. And, and there's a real, um, lots of studies have shown that it's a really high um, risk factor for failure. Um, I think you have to go back to what you're trying to achieve. Um, and the end goal is to give somebody a sensate, functional, painless finger. Um, and if you feel that actually by replanting a very badly evulsed finger would only give them a very stiff finger that you know is cold has cold intolerance and is um, actually going to hamper the way they use the rest of their hand then actually is you know you might it might boost your ego to be able to do a replant but actually you're not making a difference that you're making things worse for the patient so so um very nasty evulsion injuries um you need to think very carefully about it um, but having said that, I think the indications for replants have changed. So all the, all the indications now that um, are in textbooks about when, you know, which um, types of injuries you should um, try replant on, these are based in, uh, on data that are 30, 40 years old, you know, um, and we, things have gone, come a long, long way since then. And I think um, we've done a number of um, Urbaniac um, type three avulsion amputation replants and traditionally that's been we've been told that actually you should just chuck them in the bin because there's, there's no point even if you succeed they'll have stiff painful fingers but we found actually really quite good results so I think um, you know things are evolving and um, until we get large um, prospective cohort studies with proper patient reported outcome measures um, we can't be absolutely sure I think that's an important point. As a trainee, I would say every one of the cases we've presented tonight, I was told was not suitable for replantation. I was taught, well, if it's a clean cut, sharp cut, uh, that's the ones to go for. But actually, of course, those aren't the ones that you necessarily see. Uh, so sometimes it is important to challenge the dogma. I had a question as well about um, pediatric outcomes when you're doing uh, vein and nerve grafts and with the growth of, of the limb and the hand, how do those grafts tend to fare over time? So children actually tend to do better than adults. 
Um, certainly, um, there can be interruption of growth plates, so it depends. In fact, like most uh, children that present are going to be on the older edge of the spectrum, so a lot of the growth has already happened. Um, we, like we don't tend to see very young children who come in needing replants. Uh, so I would say overall that children are the best candidates for replants. The um, the, the that case that we um, shared, the six year old um, boy, he actually his fracture was actually through the growth plate of his middle phalanx, and you can see that his um, finger um, is shorter than the rest of him, which is you know growing in proportion. So. So, um, but having said that, you know, the, the um, it's probably, if you can get function in it that's useful, like he has, then it's probably worth it. And I think the other thing in children, it does tend to be a very emotive injury. So it, that's a situation where you would tend to really always try. Great. Um, there's some broader questions. Um, so for our medical students in the audience, um, somebody has asked, what is the best advice for getting onto plastic surgery program as it's very competitive? Okay, well, I think a really good thing is to try and make some links and to get some actual practical experience. And then you have much more of an understanding about the specialty. And then you can meet people that can give you advice about how to do that. Certainly, it is competitive. But I think the will to do it is more important than anything else. And I can tell you that a lot of people told me, give up now, you'll never get there. And don't listen to advice like that. I think in life, if you want to do anything, you just have to be tenacious and stick with it and um, get information and talk to people and um, that's the way to succeed but um, we're always very happy to have any visitors come to our unit and if you want to speak to either of us to ask for advice it would be very willing to give every bit of advice we could about how to move forward and attain those goals and I think get inspired you know the um, the more you see the more inspired you get, um, you become. And uh, there are various places like Ganga Hospital, for example, or the Changgung Memorial Hospital in Taiwan, or, you know, there are lots of great units here in the UK where you can just go and visit for a week or two and just see some cases and expand your knowledge and speak to people and pick up bits and pieces. The, the, the real gems are picked up on, in corridor conversations rather than from textbooks and I really I'm a great advocate for going around and just seeing as much as you possibly can around the world and also I'm contractually obliged to say that joining stash is a good idea for um yeah I mean that's <laughs> mandatory that goes without saying Liam <laughs> yeah um so there's a question about requirements to set up microsurgery practice labs for trainees um, I don't know if either of you could comment on that. What's what's the question? Contractual what, obligation. Yeah. No. What what are the requirements to set up a microsurgery practice lab? Well, I think well. So I don't think there are any requirements on that, and there's lots of work going on in all kinds of ways. Um, certainly, there's an online course where you get bits sent to you in the post and you can use a phone so you can use all kinds of medium to set up some kind of practice situation um, we've been talking about this quite a lot just with views to taking setups out to other countries but I do think it's really good having quite a good quality microscope because you want something that's going to inspire you that you're going to be able to use that works well that you can see what you're doing and you can see and focus and instruments that actually work because I think it can be off-putting if you you're using substandard instruments um, but I don't think that it's a difficult thing to do because actually microscopes are very cheaply available lots of our trainees have purchased their own and they practice at home using chicken legs and there's lots of synthetic um, options you can use we use some silicon tubes and actually those are very practical and much cleaner than using animal tissue so um, I don't think that there's any specific um, difficulties in setting up but again worth asking other people's experience or visiting somebody that successfully set up a, um, a setup in order to get more information about it 
And I think the um there the are various very kind of famous courses out there that are great. So there's um one in I think Columbia University, uh, that which is a five day course. There's um the Ganga microsurgery course, which is fantastic. I went on that. And that's a a week in the lab. Um, so you can come to our course. <laughs> um, but uh, and there's the um is it the Norfolk Park? Park? Yeah, Norfolk Park. Park yeah. one at the Royal College of Edinburgh, um, surgeons in Edinburgh does one, Glasgow, they, they've got one too. So there are lot, lots of different courses around, um, but you can definitely buy your own setup at home if you are keen and it'll cost a few hundred pounds, probably three or 400 pounds to get a whole setup with the kits and with the silicon tubes and um, suture material and so on. I would also say I did the Ganga um, microsurgery course as part of the Bruce Bailey Fellowship. And I think that is a, just brilliant. So it's a live rat course. So you can see whether your anastomosis actually flows. And then you're invited to just walk around the theatres when the course finishes and you see amazing things. And I use things as a consultant that I learn in Ganga, just watching what's going on, because there's loads of operating theatres going on simultaneously and loads of very significant trauma in a volume we just don't see in the UK certainly so I would definitely recommend that it's also very reasonably priced but you do have to pay to get out there I think it's probably about time for one final question um so somebody has asked why is fat tissue initially left on the flaps and then removed later for cosmesis rather than being removed right away very good question. So James, do you want to answer that? Yeah, so, so it depends um, what you're comfortable with. So, so some people are very happy to just take the whole fat layer and take the fascia is a much easier way of raising a flat because you've got very clear planes. Sometimes like in that um, kid who had the a false finger and we um, put a free flap on his, um, uh, on the, the gloved finger, we actually took it in the um, su I said what we call a super thin flap. So we took it um, in between the two in a long and more superficial fascial layer, but even that was too fat. Uh, and so really th the thinner you make it in the, um, at the start, the more risky it is that the flap doesn't work. So, so it's a balance. Um, and sometimes you, you can take a super thin flap and it works beautifully and that's it you don't need to do any kind of um, corrective surgery afterwards but uh, in other times like um, particularly in trauma settings you want the thing to work and you just want soft tissue coverage and then anything else is um, cherry on top and you know um, and and so they, they may need um, two or three more operations afterwards but these are small operations and it's not um, and they're not risky at all. So uh, traditionally, like the original description of the ALT is a subfascial flap. So you take the fascial layer and it depends a lot on the patient. So the patients that James saw in Taiwan tend to be very thin. And uh, in Western culture, we often see much thicker flaps. So you can take a suprafascial flap, a very thin flap, but even in those situations, and as we've said, the risks are higher. So you want to do a safe operation that works well, primarily, but even with the suprafascial flap, if you're going onto an area like a finger, you're probably going to want to thin that. But the main issue is having a good blood supply at the beginning. And sometimes you can compromise that if you end up taking too much fat away. So a really great question to end things there. Um, can I just say that I'm sure everyone in the audience will join me in uh, extending a warm thank you to um, Rebecca and to James uh, for a fascinating, fascinating webinar. Um, so thanks both very much. And we will see you hopefully all at our next uh, webinar. Please remember to fill out the feedback form for our speakers and also to uh, consider joining Stash as a member for just £25. So all of that can be found on the BSSH website. We'll see you all Thank next you. time.